Hello, everyone. Are you taking pictures of these days that we're having? We need some kind of a way to capture the weather. Tomorrow is going to be clear in 75 and 3 mile per hour winds. Yeah, it's not deer hunting weather. Not deer hunting weather yet. What's that? Gorgeous. It is absolutely gorgeous. Well, yeah, that's right. I don't know. I don't think we're at 7 o'clock yet, so I'm just going to say hello and howdy to everybody that's actually in the room. I'm sure glad you're here because anything but live stream only. I am, I am thrilled with anything but just live stream only. So it's good to have um, you guys in the room tonight. So this is a little bit different study. And so if I, you know, really get going and, um, and you've got a question or you want to stop me, you can do that. And just, uh, and if you, you can too, you know, can you got to stop you. Yeah, you can okay. stop me. Just say, Hey, will you slow down a minute? Let me ask a question about this. All right. So this is cool. We're probably getting ready to go live. So Eric, uh, what are we doing tonight? We are. Well, we're talking about the uh, unjust steward. So yeah. we're going to be uh, talking about stewardship and uh, again, our favorite topic, money. Oh, yeah. And uh, how that uh, How many of you just love to talk us? about money? <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> she, there we got one honest person back there in the whole group. Absolutely. That's good. So we're going to talk. You know, it's interesting. If I, were to, if I were to say this to you, you guys talk back. Hello, everybody out there that's watching on Facebook Live. This is Table Talk. Pastor Phil here, Eric Borseth, one of our deacons and also my helper at this time. Thank you guys for coming in and joining with us that are waltzing in. And we're glad that you all are here, whether you're watching on Facebook Live or whether you're here. Now, if I, if I, said, if I said that somebody called me shrewd, how do, you, how do you take the word shrewd? So-and-so is a very shrewd person. How do you, do you take that as a positive comment or a negative comment? I've been watching my wallet. <laughs> You've been watching your wallet. That's pretty good. Anybody else? What do you got to say about it? What do you got to say, Dean? A shrewd thing would be positive. Okay. What do you get? Uh, Lois, what do you think? You think shrewd is positive. You call somebody shrewd. Wise. Okay. That's good. Pretty good. Uh, I, I was thinking about the um, Pastor Nelms one time said he was, he was preaching a sermon one time. And he was talking about a Hey, I forget, it just comes to mind when I say the word shrewd. He said that somebody was a crude dude in a rude mood because he was very shrewd. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I don't know why that came to mind at this point, but it did. So we're going to turn to Luke 16 tonight, and we're going to talk about a shrewd person, a shrewd money manager, but he was a thief. So don't let that... Don't let that put you off about what we're going to talk about. Before we do, we need to have prayer, and we need to pray for Pastor Marty. Um, you guys know Pastor Marty had a pacemaker put in, all of you that are out there listening. Dear friend uh, and also co-laborer here at the church, but he had a pacemaker put in, and the pacemaker's working real well, but without going into a lot of detail, you know, he's not back and he's not active and everything. We've actually asked him to take it easy, slow down. He's wanting to come back in and just do things. But without going into detail, there are complications. So we still need to pray for Pastor Marty. Not with the pacemaker, but just with his own condition. So I, I don't want to scare you or anything, but we just need to pray for Pastor Marty tonight and ask the Lord to help him. And uh, we want to pray as well for some opportunities. And I'm not going to give any names, but two opportunities I have to share Christ with some people um, one of them I won't ever see again, at least unless God does something, he's going to be moving to Atlanta. And another one uh, that uh, has just expressed desire to know what it is to be saved. So I'm going to talk to them this week. So just be praying for those two people. I won't name them. Pray for Chris and Kathy Mavity. I uh, announced on Sunday, and by now I think you probably got an email, sort of a general email telling you that they are, uh, they, you know, that the elders have extended them an invitation to come and work as community life pastor in the church, and they have accepted. They're in the process. In fact, he's already working uh, remotely, uh, interacting already, starting to meet different people and doing Zoom with different uh, group leaders and stuff. So it's kind of exciting. And he has already taken over uh, taking my sermons 
and making them right. No, he's taking my <laughs> sermons, <laughs> and he is going to be doing the, uh, the questions and all those kind of things, oh, getting them ready for groups excellent. and stuff. So, in fact, that's, that's pretty exciting. So we got some things to pray for here. Um, let's just stop, and Eric, why don't you lead us in prayer right. for Pastor Marty, Chris, and Kathy on the way, for a couple of people that I have an opportunity to share Christ with this week. Very good. Dear Lord God, our Father in heaven, we come before you tonight uh, in awesome wonder of the uh, nature of God and the, and the wonderful blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Uh, Lord, we offer our praise and worship to you tonight. Uh, we come tonight to learn. Uh, we come tonight for fellowship. And we come tonight, Lord, to be drawn closer to you. So as we uh, think about our own relationship with you, Lord, we th we also think about those uh, co-laborers here at Grace, uh, Pastor Marty, who is uh, having some health concerns right now with his heart. Uh, we know, Lord, that uh, you have a special place in your heart for all those who have devoted their lives to you. So we hold up uh, Pastor Marty tonight as he uh, is attempting to uh, recover from the uh, surgery he had with the pacemaker. We pray, Lord, that you uh, put your uh, loving arms around him, uh, give him peace uh, with his current situation, and send your healing spirit upon him to uh, heal that heart and uh, make sure that that pacemaker is effective in keeping him in rhythm. We'd hate to have Par Pastor Marty out of rhythm because then we wouldn't know what to do with him. Lord, we pray for uh, Chris and Kathy Mavity as they uh, are coming to grace here to uh, take over the position that was uh, held um, by Pastor Greg. Uh, we know he's got good, uh, big shoes to fill, uh, but uh, the excitement that he's generating is uh, uh, obvious here within the church and within the staff. So, Lord, we pray that he's able to finish up his responsibilities in Colorado uh, to everyone's satisfaction and at the same time be able to work his way into a routine here at Grace uh, and we pray for their safe travel as they return and that they're able to find good housing. Uh, that We pray, Lord, that you just pave the way for all of those uh, life's necessities uh, uh, that just fall into place for them uh, so that they're not deterred and uh, swayed away from the work that you have set before them. Uh, Lord, we pray for all those who are seeking Christ, but particularly those who... Uh, are going to be talking with Pastor Phil here this week. We pray, Lord, that uh, you open their hearts and minds to the word that they are going to receive. We pray that it uh, not only be planted in their hearts, but that it sprout and grow. We pray that you be with everyone here at the uh, church tonight and those online who are uh, listening in on our conversation tonight about the unjust steward and the message that Jesus had not only for the Pharisees and the people listening to him, but specifically for the disciples who were continually uh, listening to uh, Jesus and trying to understand the message that he had. So we pray, Lord, that you uh, make that clear to us tonight. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 All right, so you got your Bible open to chapter 16, and uh, we're going to look at it last time. When we were together, we, took the, we looked at a, a person that God actually called a fool, and uh, he was the rich fool, and, and he was a fool because he thought that, uh, he, thought that he could prepare for, he, that if he was making physical and material preparations, that he was actually preparing for his soul, uh, but he wasn't, and uh, God said he was a fool because that night uh, his soul was going to be required of him. And so that was about money. And uh, it's interesting, I think we need to take a step back before we get into chapter 16 and just see how many of these parables, how much of this teaching, Jesus is teaching about money. Now, please, you know, at the outset, I'm, I'm talking about the principles concerning money. Uh, it's uh, how we acquire it, how we use it, uh, how we employ it, and all those things has nothing to do with asking anybody for money. So this hasn't got anything to do with our offerings at the church. Or, we're just simply looking at these startling stories uh, called the parables and what Jesus said. And uh, it's absolutely amazing uh, how many times money comes up. So if you start with chapter 16, verse 14, I want you to see the series of stories about money is going to come to a head. And chapter 16, verse 14 says this, The Pharisees 
who were lovers of money. You say, what do you mean? You mean there are religious people, religious leaders who love money? (laughs) Yeah, there always have been. And here are some right here. The Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all of these things and they derided him, which means they mocked him, they ridiculed him, they derided him, and they made fun of everything he was saying. So uh, I want you to see a few of these things. Back in Luke 12, don't turn there, but just let me rehearse how many times this comes up. In Luke 12, we had that story about the interruption of Jesus' teaching by a man who wanted Jesus to be the arbitrator of the inheritance between he, the younger brother, and the older brother. Remember, we studied that. He said, hey, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He wanted more of it. And, um, and so we saw that Jesus dealt with him. He, called him he, called, he told the story of the rich fool. And so this story was about money, right, Eric? I mean, it was about money. Yep. And then in chapter 14, um, Jesus sat down to eat with the Pharisee. Remember, we studied this story as well. He sat down to eat with the Pharisee, and he was observing all the, the way that the guests arrived, and they wanted to seat, sit in the best seats. They wanted to honor themselves. They wanted to, to seek the, just seek to be recognized. Jesus taught them about humility. He taught them about sharing with the poor. He taught them about the cost of discipleship. And then he made this astounding, astounding statement at the end of the chapter. In chapter 14, verse 33, he said, Likewise, whoever of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. And we studied that. We talked about not give away, but give up. Put it under the ownership of Jesus and not our own personal ownership. So once again, in chapter 14, he was teaching about money. Then the whole book, or the whole chapter, excuse me, chapter 15, uh, is taken up with the Pharisees' perverted value system. Uh, they, there was a story of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost brother. Three lost things in a row. We studied them, emphasizing the lost brother, uh, the prodigal, and all of them pointed to the same teaching. The teaching was that the Pharisees valued money more than people. The older brother, representing the religious leaders, he had a double portion. He was owner of everything his father had, but he was angry when the prodigal came home. Instead of being glad that he repented, came home, and was reclaimed, he was angry. I guess he thought he was going to lose some of what he had. Well, he did. He threw a party for for his brother with his money. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. His dad took some of his money and threw a party for him. So, uh, but the, what I, the point that I want to make is, is the entirety of chapter 15 is about dealing with money, and the parable was told having to do with money. So now we come to chapter 16. There is an undeniable link between the prodigal of chapter 16. What did the prodigal do with his money? What is the word that the Bible says? What did he do with his, his inheritance? He went away, and what did he do? Squandered, squandered it. it. Remember that? We don't use that word all the time anymore, but squandered. He wasted all of his living and he came into poverty. So there's an undeniable link between the prodigal who squandered his own money and the steward of the passage we're going to read right now who squandered his master's money. Now, it's one thing to be a fool with your own money. It's another thing to be put in charge of other people's money and to, to squander that. Listen to the story. Eric, you want to read it? You yeah, got I it? I would be happy to. Yeah. All right, why don't you read that? It's uh, 16, it goes all the way down to 13. Go ahead. Now, he Six. was also saying to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do, so that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors, And he began saying to the first, How much money do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age 
are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourself by means of wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. He who is faithful in, a ver in very little is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you, who, who entrust the riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Let's be clear about that last verse. It doesn't say it's not a good idea to try to serve God and wealth. It didn't say it's difficult to serve God and money. It says you what? Cannot. Now who is speaking? If you have a red letter Bible, what color is that? I know that that doesn't mean it's any more the Word of God than anything else in there, but I do think it's significant that Jesus Himself once again is teaching on money, and He says to His disciples, notice in 16.1, He also said to His disciples. Now, He spoke to individuals, He spoke to groups, He spoke to the Pharisees, He spoke, but here He zeroes in on His disciples, we are His disciples, and so you bet He is speaking to us. He's telling us something. He is warning us about something. And uh, I've got to clear up a few things here as we look at this uh, to get into it. This, there was, so don't forget, there's a link between the prodigal who squandered his own money and the steward who squandered somebody else's money. So in so many words, what's the story, Eric? Just, tell, just quickly, what happened? What did, what, what, what did this guy do? Well, he was uh, stealing from his boss. Yeah. And uh, he got caught. Yeah. And so he was being called to account for it. Yeah. So he didn't just get fired. He got, you come into the office and bring the books. I want to see exactly what you did. He didn't did. just say, clear your desk and yeah. we're going to march you out of the building. A little different than today, right? Uh, today they said, you're done. You're out of here. Clear your desk. March him out. No. He said, you're done. And uh, evidently there was a little space of time. Right. Because what did he do? He went out and did what? Oh, he went out to try and save his hiney. <laughs> <laughs> Says, I got to find a place to That's go. That's not in the King James Version, <laughs> folks. Just thought I'd tell you that. <laughs> he, what did he, he do? He was going to get called before the boss and have to show him how much money he's been stealing. Yeah. There was going to be hell to pay. Yeah. And he didn't want that. So he knew that when I get canned, I need something to do. I need a place to go. I need somebody to take care of me. Yeah. Because I can't do it myself. So he's trying to figure out, what am I going to do in what the future? He said, you guys that are out here, well, he, there were two things he said he wasn't going to do. He couldn't do one and he wouldn't do the other. What couldn't he do? He couldn't what? Dig. Dig. He must have been, you know, an older guy or in bad health or he'd been skimming so long he'd gotten fat and lazy and he just couldn't do it. So he couldn't dig and then what else would he not do? Beg. He wasn't going to dig and he wasn't going to beg. And so he said, but I know what I will do. And what he did do is he started calling in the debtors. So you get the idea that he is a money manager. He is the steward. He, is, he has been left in charge. Now, folks, this has happened more than once in the Gospels. Uh, do you remember the story of the talents? There was a, 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 there was a husbandman. Uh, there's two stories. One about a vineyard that was let out to some people that they were supposed to take care of it. And when he came back, they mistreated the servants. They mistreated the son. And the other one about the talents. He gave one five talents, two talents, one talent. And he says, when I come back, I want you to have something, to, some increase, you know. And uh, so this is, this is a common thing. Mm -hmm. We get this idea that there is an investment of God Almighty, if we stop and think about this. There's an investment in God, of God Almighty in every person, and he expects us to use use his investment for his glory and his gain. Well, this story is a story about an earthly master who evidently was wealthy, and he had let, he'd gone off somewhere, and he'd left this money manager in charge. He completely blew it. He figured the guy was never coming back. He began to skim the money, and he began to inflate the bills. Let me explain that to you. I need to give you, clear up a few things. First of all, uh, what is a steward? 
What is a steward? Well, a steward is someone who manages another person's wealth. That's just the simplest way we can say it. A steward is, and how many of those do we have today? I mean, what do we call them? Financial managers. We call them investment people who help us with our hedge fund managers and portfolios, all these things, you know. So a steward is someone who manages another's wealth. Uh, He does not own the wealth himself, but he has this privilege of enjoying it personally. He made a profit from it. It It's not not anything wrong with with earning a living at it, but uh, it was supposed to be for the profit of the manager. So the clear requirement is this, that believers, as we are believers, we are to understand we are not owners, but managers of what God places under our care. We are stewards, all of us. We have stewardship. And 1 Corinthians 4.2 gives us the simplest requirement that stewardship has, and that is it's required of stewards that we be found faithful. Obviously, anybody out there that's watching the live stream or the Facebook, uh, or whether you're, it's obvious that he was not faithful. He was worried about only one thing. He was worried about his own self, his own personal leisure and pleasure and increase. He wasn't worried about making money for uh, the, his boss. Now, what does the word shrewd mean? Now, it's used in the passage more than once. Uh, it says, take your bill and write 80. So the master, verse 8, the master commended the unjust steward. Now, he commended him. It didn't say he was pleased with him. Don't get mixed up on this now. It didn't say he was happy, going to give him a bonus. No, 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 no. He, he just commended him because of his, of his shrewdness. He commended him because he had dealt shrewdly. And then it makes this statement. The sons of this world, that is unbelievers, many times are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Who do we identify with as being the sons of light? We are. We're believers. He's making a simple statement. Many times the people of this world are more shrewd, and I'll tell you what the word means in a minute in the Bible, than they're more shrewd, they're more, they, they, they act more wisely than the people of light do with the stuff of this world. Let me go on and see if I can give a little bit hold. Now, we might associate the word with certain professions. I couldn't resist this here. I mean, you can see what I wrote. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> a shrewd lawyer, right? If a lawyer is shrewd, then I mean, he knows how to find loopholes. Or maybe a shrewd businessman or businesswoman who knows how to get an advantage or benefit from competitors' weaknesses, or even a shrewd politician. Uh, today, we think of these words. This is what we think of when we think of shrewd. We think of cunning, wily, astute, clever, tough. We might even think underhanded. But the word in the Bible means this. It's all it means. It means to act with forethought. To act with forethought. He congratulated the money manager because he acted with forethought. He looked ahead. And uh, this is very important. Uh, the, the, The wise, let me give you a few other passages in the scripture. The wise or shrewd man, same word in Greek. The wise or the shrewd man built his house on the rock. So he acted with forethought. He built his house on the rock because he knew what was coming eventually. What was eventually coming to everybody who builds a house? Storms, right? So he built his house on the rock. He didn't build it on the sand. And so that was Matthew 25, 1 to 13. And then we have, no, that was Matthew 7, 24. Then we have uh, the, the virgins. There were five wise, same word, five shrewd virgins. And there were five foolish, not wise virgins. The five wise, what did they do? They prepared. They had oil in their lamp and their wicks trimmed and they were waiting on the bridegroom to come and they stayed awake waiting for him. The other virgins, five of them, not wise, had no oil in their lamps and they were, they were just fooling around. They weren't paying attention and the bridegroom came and they were not able to go into the wedding and they were left outside. So wise, that just gives you an idea. What does the word shrewd mean? It means, it's very simple. It means to, uh, to act with forethought. All right, so here we go. What is unrighteous mammon? This is very important to the story. Uh, Look at verse number 9, if you would, 16.9. It says, And I say to you, make friends of yourself by unrighteous mammon. And then again in verse number 11, Therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon. Who will commit to your trust the true riches? When we say the word mammon 
in the Bible. Uh, it's a play on the word money, but it really is talking about money. But mammon is anything that ended in an O-N in that, at that time in that language that had to do with anything deity-oriented was some sort of God. So they had made a God out of money. And so he calls it a play on words, this unrighteous money God. Unrighteous money. Now, I want to go into this just a little bit. Quite often the Bible is misquoted regarding money, okay? Uh, in seeking to use 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 as a proof text, People will say, well, the root of all evil is money. Is that true or is that not true? No. Nope. Come on, tell me what's, what is true. It says the, the love, love of, money. of money is a root, not the root, a root of all kinds of evil. Uh, and in for which some have strayed from the faith and greediness pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Clearly, it says that the love of money is the root of evil. But now I want to circle around and I want to challenge that thought. Uh, the love of money, of course, is the root of all evil. But let me ask you this question. In general, does money tend to tempt us to make an idol of it? The Bible says here, it clearly, now who is speaking? It's a red letter, if you're in a red letter Bible, who's speaking? Jesus. What does he call money? He calls it unrighteous mammon. Say those two words unrighteous mammon. You say, well, I just thought money was neutral. Jesus says it's unrighteous mammon. Now, let me go on just a little bit further with this. The word mammon includes money, possessions, or wealth in general. To call it unrighteous mammon simply means that it tends to present us with a temptation to think money can solve all of our problems. Do you know that Anything, any idea, any person, or any possession that we attribute the ability to solve our problems is an idol. Let that set on you for a moment. What is idolatry? Idolatry is to look upon anything other than God and give it divine attributes. That is... It can meet my needs, solve my problems, make me happy, and carry me on. The fool made an idol of his grain bins and his grain because he looked at them as going to be the reason that he had much money, much laid inside for many days so he could eat, drink, and be merry. He made an idol of his grain. Think about this. Didn't work out for him, though. Didn't work out for him. Uh, he ended up dying, and who got the grain? We don't know. You know, so, it, so that's the whole point. Now, let's, let's move on. Now, watch. Peter and Paul called money. Does anybody remember those two words? Filthy lucre. Filthy mammon. Filthy money. So are we supposed to just say, ooh, ugh, ugh, I don't want to ever make money. I quit. I, I'm going to quit my job. I'm not going to have anything to do with money, and I'm going to be like St. Francis of Assisi. I'm just going to walk around in poverty and just live off the beans that people give me to eat. No. No, that's not the point. Now, just, just watch. We're getting there. The fallacy of the rich fool was is that his, his money was going, to be able to, was going to be able to take care of him. Now, in a sense, we cease to manage money, and we can begin to worship money if we think money is going to fix it and solve our problems. The summary statement in verse 13 is very, very, very important. We cannot serve God and money. Now listen to these words. We can serve God with money, but we can't serve God and money. Do you see the difference in what I just said? Uh, we can only have one God in life, and I wrote on here, regardless of Hinduism. Even the Hindus, look, just trust me, I know that Hinduism, there's a sign outside the city of, of Kolkata where Carmen Swatas used to live, and she took a picture of the sign and sent it to me and said, welcome to India, the land of 330 million gods. Well, they could name 330 million, but they, they think anything and everything was a god. So, no, the truth is, is that they themselves are gods because everything was manipulated toward themselves to bring the outcome that they want. They're their own gods. There's only one God. And in Hinduism, it's self. Doesn't matter how many they try to identify out there because they're all out there to get them what they want. 
So this is really interesting. Now, so that defines a few terms. Now, let's hear the details of the parable. And, I, and so, Eric, jump in here anytime you want to. There was a day of reckoning for the manager. And this is, this is pretty awesome. You know, uh, <laughs> a man was hired to manage the property of this absentee landlord, having complete control of the assets, uh, that, that, but he had been unfaithful in his management. He was supposed to look out for the master's interest, but he began to look out for his own interest instead. Uh, I wonder how long this took. I wonder how long it took for him to think, well, he doesn't really care. He hasn't come to check on me. I haven't seen any auditors coming around. You know, I, I think I can take a little here. Do you think it started all at once or gradual, or what do you think? Typically, when you're not held accountably, accountable on a regular basis, then you tend to think that you're not going to be. And then uh, you make concessions mm. to your desires here and there. Mm. And... Uh, Pretty soon you think you guys in. think we live like that? Do you think sometimes that because God is patient, kind, long suffering, He sends us His word, He gives us His warnings, but because God doesn't come down with an axe, He doesn't send a lightning bolt, do you think sometimes we just keep stepping just a little bit further, a little bit? How about your kids when they were growing up? Did they ever try you any at all to see how far they could go before the line was, you know, even, we're even guilty of that. Sometimes we move the line. Don't do that. And then we move it back. Don't do that. And we keep moving the line. God doesn't move the line, but sometimes God doesn't immediately, immediately rain down judgment on us and we get way beyond the line. This guy, he, he was a money manager and he was skimming and he was doing a lot of other things, and we got to get into it. So he yielded to temptation to divert funds for his own purposes, his own pleasures. It's so similar to that story of the parable of the talents. I've already mentioned that. So word got to the landowner <laughs> that the steward was wasting his master's goods. Do you think word ever gets to God about the way we're doing? <laughs> he doesn't need to get word. He's watching. Yeah, he <laughs> he <knows>. sees it. <laughs> so word got to the landowner. So he was told. This manager was told, you're out. Now give an account of your stewardship and tell me what you have done with my money. Now this is a very simple illustration. The manager, the manager's skimming and he's, and he's inflating bills and he's doing all kinds of things. And so the owner says, all right, you're out. Sit down, get your books. Day after tomorrow, you come in here and sit down and we're going to talk about this. So and he received a warning. He did receive a warning. And it created a little anxiety, I think. Yeah, I, th I think so. And so what did he do? Tell me what you had done with my money. So instead of saying you're done and clear your desk, he said you're done, bring in the books. Now, folks, I have to mention Romans 14, 12 says this, so then, all, it, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now, we will give an account of himself to God for the deeds done in the body, whether good or evil. We're going to sit down. You say, well, I thought that uh, we'd never be at the great white throne. That's right. We will never be at the great white throne judgment. We will never be in danger of being thrown into hell because we are believers in Christ. If you've trusted him, now I'm, not, I'm making an assumption that the people in the room here, maybe you haven't, are believers in Jesus. You have trusted him with your eternal soul, your salvation. You believed on Jesus. All right, wonderful. We've been declared just externally from the outside. God's put a robe of righteousness on us. He's given us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We will never be in danger of eternal judgment in hell. But... Every one of us will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and we will give an account of ourselves. First, First Corinthians says that all of our deeds, all of our doings, are going to be measured, and they're going to be they're going to be tried by fire. And there's going to be wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, and precious stones. What do you think is going to last, and what's not going to last? I think I'd rather be at the mercy seat. Can we do that instead? <laughs> well, we're going to be at the mercy seat. That's the, the, but the mercy seat. But we've already been there. But we're going to be at the judgment seat. Now watch this. So the day of reckoning. Now then the shrewdness, I want you to see the shrewdness employed by the manager. And I don't want you to read the wrong thing into this. I want you to see it for what it is and understand what, the, what, the, what he was commended for. Here's where the master said his, ma his manager was shrewd. First, he formulated a plan to secure his future. He was wise. He said, look, I'm out. I'm done. I, I, there's no talking this guy out of this. My job is over. I've got to do something. So he came up with a plan. Second, he planned to ingratiate himself in the eyes of those indebted to his master. He's got all these debts out there, and he says, these people all owe money to my master, and I'm going to have to give an account for them. And my master doesn't even know what the bills are. I know what they are. 
And the people knew what they are, so he goes around, and in some cases he may not have, and so he asked one, he says, how much do you owe my master? And he says, I owe him a hundred baths of oil. In other words, maybe it was olive oil or whatever, but he owed it to him, and he says, okay, great. Sit down and write 50. Who is losing out on this thing? The owner, or maybe not. Let me show you, and let me go a little further. So he began to give discounts on the debts. You say, how is this possible? Now watch, there's a loophole in the law. This guy is shrewd, like a lot of lawyers. So you say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> I say that like a what? You say that like it's a bad thing. Okay, kind of so there was a loophole in the law. So the Jews, here's how they operated. Now make sure you understand this. They operated under a system where interest, they called it usury. Did you ever hear that word? The, the word, Old Testament word is usury or interest. It was against the law of, of the Jews to charge interest to a fellow Jew. They could not do it. Listen to Exodus chapter 22. If you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. Uh, I'm going to skip the next one. It's a little too long to read. The next one is Deuteronomy 23, 20. To a foreigner you may charge interest, but to your brother you shall not charge interest, that the Lord your God may bless you in all which you set your hand in the land to do which you are entering to possess. So they were not supposed to charge interest. They were not supposed to charge handling fees, merchant fees, manager fee. They were not supposed to do that with their fellow Jews. So how did this manager get around this? Well, instead of like we would do, if you went to the bank and you get a loan or if you get a loan on a car or on a house, I mean, I get one, I'm still paying, I am still, I'm paying a mortgage on a house and I get the thing in the mail every month and it'll show what I paid last month. Thankfully, I finally got on the other side of it. I'm paying more principal than interest every month, and that's kind of fun. But you know what I'm talking about. You can see the breakdown on your mortgage. It went to principal, this went to interest, this went to escrow, which is crazy. And then the, there's all these other things in it. So they got it all broken down. Well, in the Jews, what they would do is, is they would just include the interest, include any fees, include whatever they wanted to in a single number. And the master, the owner wasn't there. The manager would do it any way he wanted to. And he would just include it in one fee. And so what we see going on here is this manager is getting rid of the additional fees. So it wasn't illegal what he was doing. It was just not ethical what he was doing because he had ch his stewardship is, is a wreck. He is taking advantage of his, of his owner by skimming, and he's taking advantage of the people he's loaning to by charging them all kinds of exorbitant interest and fees and things like that. So why is he doing this? Well, let me go on. He discounted the interest in the managerial fees. That's what he did. He's going to go to the debtors and slash the bills by the amounts of this interest. And the debtors are going to be delighted to pay a much reduced. They think they're getting a deal. All he's doing is cutting out, cutting out the gravy that he added on top. So they're all excited. Oh, man, I'm getting it. You're going to cut that 50% for me in one. It was They cut it 20%. In any case, they're paying less, so they're going to be happy. And so what we have here in this story is... I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. So this shrewd money manager is thinking about his future, doesn't want to dig, he can't dig, he doesn't want to beg, and so he's going to all the debtors so that when he's put out of his managerial position, he could say, hey, remember what I did for you and cutting that bill? Right. You got a spare room? I need somewhere help to stay. Out. I can helped you, you out. You that's right. Me out. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And so he went, they went into this situation. So the unfaithful manager had made plans for his future in light, in light of a lost situation. He couldn't dig, he wouldn't beg, and so he used an angle. So what did the master commend him for? For being a thief? Did he commend him for being a thief? No. no. He didn't commend him for that. He, he, he probably didn't know anything about these exorbitant fees that were included in the bills. He just commended him for shrewdly handling this so that he had somewhere to go when he was thrown out. He wasn't pleased with him. He was escaping on a technicality. He was a crook. He was a thief. He was unfaithful. But he did have some foresight about how to plan for his future. That's the point of this portion. This man is commended 
because he took action to plan for the future in light of the present. He used his resources to plan for the future. So he was shrewd. He acted with foresight. Now we're going to have the privilege in this case. Jesus does not always explain and interpret the parables. But in this one, he takes it upon himself to interpret this one. So uh, we come to the part where he explains it and he applies the principles. And first I want to just say this from the outset. This is kind of interesting. Here's uh, what I want to say. American businessmen are quite shrewd. They're known for being very, very shrewd around the world. If there's anything free market, free market enterprise has done in the United States, it has created some very, very, very shrewd and capable and astute business people around the world. Uh, Coca-Cola has penetrated every culture, every people group of the world. I'm telling you, you cannot go anywhere on this planet that you can't find Coke. And, you know, I mean, think about how many palms they had degrees. And, how, I mean, what did they have to do to get into all these countries? Poor countries, rich countries, communist countries. It's everywhere. We got to Peru, and the first, the first American thing I saw was a giant sign when I moved there back in 1988 or 89. This giant sign right downtown that says, Coca, enjoy Coke in English in a Spanish country on this giant building down there. Man, they sold that stuff. Those kids were drinking it like by the time they were two months old. They were already on coke down in Peru. It was amazing. So they, uh, but there's some shrewd businessmen. Many other let, companies. Let me are, stop you there. All right. Bill. Just, we know that Coca-Cola and many other companies, McDonald's, et cetera, yeah, yeah. are very shrewd and they've got their tentacles throughout the world. Yeah. Can you imagine what the world would be like if the Christians were as wise, were as wise and as shrewd and pursued the kingdom of God with the same vigor that uh, they pursue money and riches. And that's the lesson, folks. Uh, we're going <laughs> to... You're right on, man. That's exactly what this is about. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. He's saying that the children of this world are much more shrewd in their operations than the children of light are with what we're doing. And they're ready to run risk. How many businesses run risk whenever they make an investment to do these kinds of things? You know, uh, a few years ago we went to England. I was dumbfounded to see how many American products are there, not just Coke and, and McDonald's. Here's one that was just amazing to me. The Hoover, vacuum, the Hoover vacuum cleaner became so dominant in England at one time that to be vacuuming your home was described as hoovering. Kind of like drinking you, a Coke. Yeah. So you pick up, you pick up, you know, you, the lady picks up the phone and somebody calls and says, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just hoovering. Not vacuuming. They're ho- because, I mean, that's how dominant this. So, I mean, just think about that. And, and it's all over the world. I love the story of this, uh, this shoe salesman. Uh, it comes from an old, uh, an old story from Florsheim Company. There's this shoe sale salesman that was sent to some African tribes. And he called back and he said, I'm coming home. They don't wear shoes. So they sent another guy over there with a better spirit and a better attitude. He called back in two days and said, send me every pair of shoes you have. Nobody has any. <laughs> so, I mean, just the, 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 the way that the risk that they're willing to take to do that. So uh, some people see opportunities. Some people see the difficulties. Well, Jesus, the master teacher, made these very clear statements beginning in verse 9. I want to read it again. I say to you, make friends of yourselves. By unrighteous mammon that when, when you fail, and I want you to take a pencil, and I want you to write in your Bible, or I want you to write in the margin, when it fails. Because it can be translated both ways. When you fail, that is you die, or when it fails and you find yourself without any, then you're going to be able to you find yourself in good shape. So make friends of yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you fail or it fails, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful to what is another man's, another man's who will give you what is your own? Then he goes on to make that final statement, no man can serve two masters. All right, that's the statement. Let's see what, it, what Jesus is actually saying. First thing is shrewdness with money can achieve eternal goals. That's the first principle. Shrewdness with money in the life of a Christian can achieve 
eternal goals. Now, I'm not passing an offering plate tonight. In fact, we don't do that at church anymore, do we? I don't, do we How even do we have offering? How do we get by offering? without that? I don't know. But we're, we're, we're doing okay. I'm not passing an offering plate, not taking up an offering. I'm just teaching you what this passage of Scripture says. So open your mind and listen to this. Whether you're out there in, 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 in digital land or you're sitting in the room, this is very important. Shrewdness with money can achieve eternal goals. We can use the mammon of unrighteousness to gain friends for eternity. Amen. We can use the mammon of of unrighteousness. Now, Gary, Jerry said amen. Last night we had a we, I say he, we, I was here, I came, it was wonderful, had a banquet, heard four testimonies that were just outstanding of people who given their life to Christ through the ministry of the Polk County Jail, and it's just absolutely incredible. And then uh, a lady talked, and, and she had uh, also come to faith, and uh, at the end there were some envelopes there, and an opportunity was given for anyone who felt led by God and wanted to support Give some money to the Polk County Jail Ministry for the ongoing work of supplying Bibles and uh, getting, you know, paying the salaries of different people that work there. If you want to do that and you want to invest in that, then you can do that. How, how does this connection get made? The unrighteous mammon, the money that could become our God, gets put under the stewardship and ownership of God, and we take some of it and we put it in this envelope, we give it to them, and then all of a sudden this money becomes, now, now it's not just unrighteous mammon, now it's a tool to be used for the propagation of the gospel, in this case, specifically in the Polk County Jail. And I can tell you that this church supports Brother Jerry and the Polk County, County Jail Ministry. There is no mission endeavor that we have anywhere in the world that is seeing the continual results and salvations of souls like the Polk County Jail. I'm just telling you, let's give God the glory for that. It's just absolutely wonderful what the Lord is doing. So we can use mammon of unrighteousness to gain friends for eternity. Well, what about that? What do you mean gain friends for eternity? Well, let me keep going. Wealth, money, and possessions have enormous power. We all know that. But money is not neutral. We have heard it all of our lives, but here Jesus clearly declares that it is mammon of unrighteousness. So this might help us understand why Jesus said what he did back in, in Luke 14, 33. He says, whoever of you who does not forsake all he has cannot be my disciple. Because it's a question of God versus money. You see, we have to put it all under his control or else it's always going to be a threat to become our God. Whoever doesn't forsake all he has cannot be his true disciple. We can't really follow him totally with our whole heart as long as we got it in our head that I'll give God his little 10%, but I'm holding on to this 90. I'm going to do anything I want to with it. Oh, no. God is Lord of all. And we're managing all of it for his glory. Now, that doesn't mean we don't buy shoes and supply a house and go on a vacation. It means that we don't frivolously think that it's all mine. I gave God his portion. I paid him off. And now it's all mine. Think about that. This is so important. Now, we talked about it. It means to give up ownership and to take up management, faithful management of all that God puts under our care. So the Lord calls us to recognize the limits of wealth. Look again at verse 9. I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. The word for you fail can be this, that it fails or that you fail or it fails. So money, money only carries you until it runs out or it only carries you until you die. But money can go no further. We only have the administration of the money while we live and while we have it. The story about a business owner in Chicago uh, that... that uh, uh, owned, uh, he owned an investment company in Chicago when the Chicago fire hit. When the fire hit, um, he rushed and told him, says, listen, I want you to take every penny that we have, and I want you to give it to D.L. Moody. And they said, what? Give it to Moody? He said, we, we need it. No, no, I want you to take every penny that's, that's in my name, that's in the bank. I want you to take every penny and give it to D.L. Moody. Why? He says, because it's going to burn up. We're going to lose everything. He says, but everything I invest in that ministry is going to end up in eternity, and it's going to be used to bring people to Jesus. Interesting stuff. That's pretty shrewd. That is very shrewd. Now, here's what Jesus is saying. Christians are not as shrewd as they should be with their worldly mammon. Instead of a mentality of eat, drink, and be merry, we should plan now for future 
inevitabilities. And I like that word, inevitability. It's something's going to happen. You're not going to stop it. What is the future inevitability in everyone's life? What is coming? Death and judgment. Death. And taxes. <laughs> That's pretty good. So that is the fu- <coughs> excuse me, the future inevitability. We are going to die. And uh, at that point, just like Solomon said, I'm not, I don't know who's going to, he, he said, I don't know what my son's going to do, whether he's going to be a fool or wise. I don't know what he's going to do with everything I leave him. And so he said, I better invest it now. And this, Jesus is saying the same thing. So make sure that we make provisions and for ourselves. Now, you say, what about this deal of, of um, gaining friends? Well, I'm coming to it. So invest your money in people for eternity. We have no idea how our gifts and offerings to God's church, His missionaries, and His servants are going to pay off in heaven. Just imagine this. Imagine an encounter like this in heaven. Uh, you don't, uh, somebody comes up to you in heaven after you died, and they say, you don't know me, but you gave some money to buy Bibles for China in 2016. Uh, a man named John Honeycutt gave me one of those Bibles, and I began to read it, and then he sat down and showed me what it meant to be a Christian, and I got saved, but then I got killed because I became a Christian in China, and I just want you to know I'm very thankful that you gave. You remember 2016? We took up money for John Huddycutt's Bible Project and for buying washing machines that they were going to start businesses with in interior China and those kind of things. And we got reports of many, many, many people coming to faith. God is calling us to shrewd, very shrewd um, use of our money. I think I have put my story that I was going to read in another Bible. I had another Bible I was going to bring. At the last minute, I brought this one. So we're going to skip the illustration. Let's go to the next one. So God is calling us to shrewd discipleship. He wants us to maximize our earthly possessions for eternity. And he wants us to have a welcoming committee in heaven. This man Everything was earthbound, and he was, he, this manager, he had the foresight to cut the, cut the fluff out of the debts of these people so that he could go to their home and have a place to be after he lost his job. In other words, he had foresight for the future. The principle here is, is that just like he was welcomed into the homes of the debtors that he reduced their bill, if we invest in eternity with our unrighteous mammon, we're sending friends on ahead so that we have a welcoming committee when we get to heaven. It's exactly what Jesus is teaching. It's not difficult. It's not hard. And so somebody's going to say, well, there goes Pastor Phil. He just wants some of my money. I, I don't want anything. I think we need to get a plate right now and pass it around. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, man. Get the plate. So the point, the point is simple. Jesus said, we need to be at least as wise as the children of this world with unrighteous mammon. It becomes righteous mammon and a tool for God. Remember chapter 14, verse 33, when we forsake it all and realize we're not the owners. When I'm not the owner and the owner is instructing me and encouraging me to invest it for eternity, then I'm, you know, <laughs> I do remember one story uh, that um, a guy from Texas that was, uh, he came and spoke to us one time and he was telling about, I think it was that uh, Zig Ziglar. You guys remember, how many of you remember Zig Ziglar? Yep. Zig Ziglar, yeah. you remember him? And he loved the Lord and he was a big giver and everything. And he told the story one time about how uh, when he was, he was, he didn't know whether the Lord would let him buy a camper. To t- he had a lot of money, but he didn't know whether the Lord was going to let him take some of his money. He'd given all his money to the Lord. And he didn't know that it would be okay if he'd buy a camper. So he, he finally, he him hauled around and said, I guess it would be okay for us to buy a camper. We'll use it for Jesus. You know, we'll, we'll just you use this. And so he bought this camper, and they're, you know, they're going to ride around in this RV. You know, they're going to ride around the RV and have it. Well, they bought this camper, this RV. When they bought it, the first thing they did, he, his wife, and the kids, they all got in it, got around the little tiny table on the inside, got down on their knees, opened their Bible, read some verses, and he dedicated it to the Lord. He said, oh, God, this, I've taken some of your money, and I bought this camper with this. And so this is your camper, and it is available to use for you at any time, any way you want to use it. And so they went on their first camping trip, and they pulled up, they parked, They went on a walk. They came back, and their camper was on fire, totally burned to crisp, (laughs) just totally burned to a crisp. And Zig Ziglar came, ah, he's jumping up and down. Oh, no, there goes the 
care of my camper. My... And so his kid, his son, says to him, says, hey, Dad, what are you so upset about? And he said, what are you talking about? The camper's burning. He said, well, it's not your camper. It's God's camper. <laughs> Let's get some hot dogs and a stick. <laughs> so the whole point is, is that Luke 14, if a man does not, a woman, a person, a Christian does not forsake all that he has, that is, give it up, put it in God's hands. If we don't do that, we really can't be his disciple. He never is going to have access to it because we're going to want to eat, drink, and be merry with it. Or get something bigger, better, faster, newer, right? We'll get rid of that old car, get a newer one. Get rid of that old dump house and get a bigger one. It's just what we're going to do. You know, now sometimes there's a reason to do that, and it's a good idea. But the point is, is that, boy, we're supposed to put it in God's hands, and it's supposed to be used for eternity. Well, verses 10 to 12, we read that a minute ago. Stewardship of money has eternal consequences. <laughs> point one, we are required to be faithful with our resources. Everything belongs to God. We're managers. We're not supposed to get the idea that we sit on piles of money and we live like paupers. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that, well, we just build up all this money and we say it's all God's and we just don't waste it and build up all the money. We're waiting on the right time. No, it doesn't mean we can't enjoy it. Listen to 1 Timothy 16, 7. God has given us everything he has to enjoy, but within limits. He wants us to enjoy what we have. I said it last week. If you've got an RV, use it. You know, if you've got, a, if you've got a whatever it is, and if you have a fishing boat, invite the pastor you know, to go. I'm, I'm just saying. So the point is, is that use it. So uh, let's say you have the gift of gaining, and you've got lots of money. And I say to you, if you have the gift of gaining, and there's, there's rich people, God has given people wonderful gifts. Many times if you have the gift of gaining, God intends for you to have the gift of giving. If you have the gift of gaining and God, you do, everything you touch turns to profit, wonderful. Then more power to you. You are a believer and you give 10% of the Lord. You say, this is wonderful. God's been good to me. I'm going to give 10% of the Lord by way of your tithe. I say, excellent. But if you made a million last year, does that mean you should take the other 90%, 900,000, save a little bit, and then just live it up by everything your little heart desires, take every trip you want and consume the rest? Is that what God wants us to do with that? Or should we think? What was, it, what was it that the guy that had the barns and he built bigger barns, what was it that he failed to do? He said he took counsel with himself, and I will build bigger barns, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years, eat, drink, and be merry. Did he ever even contemplate any other need that there might be out there? He didn't even give a tithe, you see. So he didn't even think of others. He didn't think of God. He didn't think of God's work. So look at these parallels in this passage. It talks about what is least, that's worldly possessions, and what is much, spiritual riches. A lot of times we equate worldly possessions and worldly wealth with God's blessing. Uh, the spiritual riches that God gives us and spiritual understanding and eternal rewards is far greater than anything we could possess on earth. Uh, it talks about unrighteous mammon and what are the true riches of God. Then it talks about somebody else's property, worldly wealth, and the property of your own, which is heavenly treasure. So shrewd disciples use money in light of eternal consequences. And finally, verse 13, this is the last verse and we got to finish. Shrewd use of money prevents bondage to money. You know, money can become a you know, it's a wonderful tool, but it's a terrible master. It's a wonderful blessing to use, but it's a terrible master to serve. It is so important for us to understand it. This is not a thought uh, for our consideration. This is revealed truth from God in verse number 13. No servant can serve two masters. He would either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. And then the final statement, you cannot serve God and mammon. What did the Pharisees to say to that? <laughs> Listen to this babbler. What is he saying? We all love God. We all love money. He's crazy. Jesus said, you cannot. You can serve God with money. You cannot serve God and money. And here's what I want to share. Um, we either will serve God with our money or we will serve money itself and make it our God. Either God owns our wealth or our wealth owns us. Let's take a mental test. 
When you pay your tithes or you give an offering or you make a sacrificial gift, do you worry you won't have enough? Do you weep as you see it go or do you do it cheerfully knowing that it's in God's hands, the safest investment that you can make? Some people, you know, they grudgingly give. Well, don't even do it because you've ruined it already, you know, because God loves what kind of a giver. Cheerful. Cheerful. And so, but if we're doing it grudgingly, then we're, we're certainly not blessing people. We're not ourselves going to receive a blessing. Uh, earlier, we learned that with Jesus, part-time discipleship is not an option. Here, we learned that there's no part-time employment with mammon or money. Even though we are earning our money, we, we can't be part-time employees of money and part-time employees of God. We just can't. It doesn't work that way. And so, how do we get our money? What do we want to get with our money? Where should we employ our resources? These are all important questions. The point of the story is, is that wise people use their present resources to maximize future opportunities. So there was this guy that got shipwrecked on an island. And uh, when he got to the island, he got shipwrecked. The next thing you know, all the natives had come to him, and they were treating him like a king. In fact, they called him king. You're going to be a king. You're going to be our king. And so, man, they spoiled him, and they gave to him, and they, oh, they just did all kinds of things. And, um, and so while he was king and everything was good, but he began to ask the questions of the people. He said, well, where's your other king? And they said, oh, and one of them finally told him, he says, oh, you know, while you're king, everything is really, really good, but you only get to be king for a year. There'll be a new king next year. And he says, and the king that was, we just throw him off the island. <laughs> so what did this king do? This temporary shipwrecked man, he, he acted shrewdly. While he was king, he had all of his servants and everybody that was serving him go to another island, build him a nice hut, build all this. He just had them go and get this thing completely ready so that when they threw him off the island, he had somewhere to go. He acted shrewdly. Well, believers, as believers, we're supposed to recognize our stewardship, and we're supposed to make sure that we... Everything, we know that everything is in God's hands. He doesn't begrudge us wanting to be able to live and take care of ourselves and our family and enjoy it. First, First Timothy 6, 17 says, enjoy the things that God has given us. But at the same time, of course, we're not going to be shrewd like this guy. And we're not going to be a thief. And we're not going to be skimming. And we're not going to be looking for loopholes. Just Jesus is simply saying this. He says, look, with this unrighteous money that you have, be careful that it doesn't become your master. It doesn't become your God. Don't serve it. Use it. Invest it. And invest it in eternal things. And it'll pay eternal dividends and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then he said it another way. For where your treasure is, what? There will your heart be also. What do you got to say about it to end this thing up? What do you think? Well, if, if any of you are like me, I had a real hard time getting past this unjust steward, that just an open, notorious sinner, and he gets caught, and by golly, he's going to get what he deserves, and I wanted him to get what he deserves. I didn't want Jesus using him as an example for us, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't get that. I kept scratching my head, what, what, why is Jesus using this guy mm -hmm. to get to us? And then it, it hit me uh, that he was a shrewd member of this world. Mm -hmm. He's not a child of light. No, he's not, he's a, not child a child of, of light. He's not saved. But he is a sinner. Mm -hmm. And the child of God is a sinner as well. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to account to our God just like he was going to have mm -hmm. to account to his master. master. Yep. So... He was shrewd in finding a place to go to take care of himself once he gets the boot. Mm -hmm. So as Christians, when we die, we need to have made our plans mm -hmm. for what's going to happen to us mm -hmm. when we pass. Mm -hmm. So we need to invest in mm -hmm. Jesus. Well, there's two aspects to that. One, and because, because of the inevitability of death, we need to make sure that we know Jesus as our personal Savior, and I think that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that we have, uh, we have received the gift, the gift of God, which is eternal life. 
then when we are God's children, we need to recognize that everything that He's put under our care, all of our possessions, whether it's home, car, house, you know, I mean, in our, we need to do a mental exercise and turn everything over to God. Say, God, everything I have is yours. Whether it's my bank account and those things that are liquid, God, I'm going to use. If they're liquid, I, or even if, I, if I'm living in a mansion, don't need a mansion, I'm going to sell down and I'm going to get into something that I can afford and that, to, that, that, that takes care of my needs and I'm going to invest. I'm going to be, I'm going to be wiser than most children of light. Most children of light are not as wise as this guy. He was a children, a child of darkness, but he knew how to plan for the future. That's what he was commended for. He planned for the future. What we need to be thinking about is planning for our eternal welcome in heaven. Absolutely. That's the point. We need to be investing. And uh, man, I, I, don't, I don't know what God has done with me completely. I don't know the sermons that I've preached the giving that I've done, the missionary endeavors that I did in Peru. I have no idea what has happened, and I don't know that I will know until we get to heaven. And I'll tell you something about you. You don't know what your witness has done. You don't know what your prayers have done, and you don't know what your giving has done. But I'll tell you who does know. God does. And we are preparing a welcome in eternal abodes. We are preparing ourselves a welcoming committee in heaven. And I just, I just pray that through all the efforts personally and all the efforts with my family, I just pray that somebody's going to come up in heaven and say, I just want you to know your sermon, your giving, your prayers made a difference. Amen. And we can all say the same thing. I'll be there for you, Phil. All right, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray, folks. Thank you so much. Dear Father, this is, a, this is an amazing passage, and these are startling stories. And at first glance, it is kind of hard to understand why this manager would be bragging on this guy. He was a skimmer, and he was a thief. But Lord, we're all sinners, every one of us. And uh, the fact that you have forgiven us and made us your own and brought us into your family and then given us the privilege of serving you and then of managing those resources that you put in our care. God, help us to be very, very alert Help us to think in terms of eternity and help us invest for eternity. And thank you so much for this group that's come out tonight. Thank you for those that tuned in on Facebook Live. And we pray, Father, as we continue looking at these startling stories, that you will build our faith, you will make us strong, and you will make us more like Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, if you have any questions or anything, I'll hang around for a minute. But that is another amazing story that Jesus used to try to teach a spiritual truth. Thanks for coming tonight. I'll hang out.